Eagle's Nest Sinkhole. Take a two-hour drive west of Orlando, Florida, beyond the mouse hats and dolphin shows, and you'll find yourself at a large clearing in a pine-filled forest. Standing at the foot of a large pond, it doesn't seem like anything particularly special, just unimpressive and scummy looking. But appearances can be deceiving. The pond itself sits over a vast underwater cave, the Eagle's Nest Sinkhole, well known for the outstanding beauty hidden below its surface. Famous amongst divers, many come to dive in its vast network of underwater caves that are considered to be some of the most beautiful in the world. The journey begins down a narrow vertical tunnel, quickly opening up into a submerged space the size of an aircraft hangar. The walls are smoothed out and shaped by hundreds of years of erosion, with side caves peeling off from the sides and painted in the slate greys, cream whites and pale blues of changing rock layers. It is an eye-opening display of natural beauty. The mouth of the cave, however, shows something far less appealing. A white sign driven into the rock bed, rusty nails holding it together, and the grim reaper standing over the bodies of divers who have been met with a terrible fate. The sign's message is far from ambiguous. Stop, it says. Prevent your death. Go no farther. There's nothing in this cave worth dying for. Do not go beyond this point. This reveals the eagle's nest's deadly past, and is both a stark reminder and a warning to divers attempting to challenge one of the world's most treacherous underwater caves. This place has claimed the lives of many who attempt to explore its magnificent caverns, and yet history and Grim Reaper sign withstanding, divers continue to do so at their peril. This is not a case of just amateur divers being beyond their ability. The Eagle's Nest takes experienced divers also, and one Sunday in October 2016, two seasoned divers befell the cave's macabre past. Patrick Peacock and Chris Rittenmeyer were there with a third friend, Justin Blakely, who was not as experienced as the others. That being the case, he stayed close to the cave's entrance, but did not journey further in. This decision would save his life. When Patrick and Chris failed to return to the pre-agreed meeting point, Justin called the emergency services. Rescue divers began their search, but it was soon clear that rather than a rescue mission, this would be a recovery. Patrick and Chris's bodies would not be found until the next day. Their bodies were not far from each other, trapped at a depth of 260 feet. It is unclear what exactly happened. Maybe it was just malfunctioning equipment, impaired visibility, or what some divers refer to as the rapture of the deep succumbing to a deadly amount of nitrogen entering the bloodstream that rapidly disorients. Perhaps the most tragic incident occurred three years prior, when the fateful depths of Eagle's Nest struck the heart of a family one Christmas. Scuba enthusiast Darren Spivy and his son, 15-year-old Dylan, were looking to test their Christmas presents, brand new air tanks, and saw the Eagle's Nest as the ideal location. This would be their last Christmas. Dylan was found lifeless at 67 feet, whilst his father was recovered on the cave floor at 127 feet. It was thought that Dylan ran through his air tank too quickly, and whilst his father was able to share the remainder of his main supply, could not reach the spare tank in time. These are just two stories amongst many of the lives lost at this dangerous place, and yet the eagle's nest still remains open today. Go back to the sign at the entrance of the cave and look closer at the Grim Reaper. He's not stopping you from entering at all, but with a raised finger beckoning you in. Do you dare to take him on? Anthrax Island Grunard Island is located in Grunard Bay, just off the shores of Scotland. The island, which is a mere 1.2 miles in length, was once covered in trees, but now sits barren and uninhabited as it has been since the 1920s. Until recently, stepping foot on this tiny island was forbidden. It's said that it was so contaminated with biological weapons that disturbing the area would release massive amounts of anthrax into the air. During World War II, military scientists of Britain's biology department began researching the use of biological weapons. In a series of experiments, codenamed Operation Vegetarian, the scientists hoped to develop a way to infect the German beef supply with anthrax. 
The strain of anthrax, Volum 14578, was chosen as this particular strain becomes more virulent as more people are exposed. That is, it becomes easier to infect and damage more hosts. And although gastrointestinal anthrax is rare, it is just as deadly. While other forms of anthrax cause abscesses of the skin and throat, Volum 14578 would cause bleeding in their digestive system, with a mortality rate of about 60%. All they needed was a place to do the testing. The scientists knew the tests would cause long-term contamination of the anthrax spores, so they sought out a remote location. Grunard Island was easily found suitable and the British government requisitioned it from the owners. In 1942, a 50-man team headed by meteorologist Sir Oliver Graham Sutton and microbiologist David Henderson headed to the island to begin Operation Vegetarian. The team brought 80 sheep along with them for testing. As seen on videotapes that became declassified in 1997, the experiments consisted of detonating an anthrax bomb above a group of sheep. Once the bomb was set off, a brownish cloud wafted towards the sheep. Later in the video, the sheep are shown being incinerated. The sheep all died within days of exposure to the anthrax spores. The scientists abandoned Operation Vegetarian when they discovered that releasing anthrax spores in the amounts they were testing would leave German cities uninhabitable for decades. Also, they were unable to decontaminate the island after the experiments had been carried out. In 1945, the original owner of the land requested the land to be returned to him. Due to the contamination still being present, this was not possible. The government agreed to take responsibility for the island and its cleanup. The family of the owner would be able to purchase the island back for £500 once that was completed. Many years passed before anything was done about the island. It was deemed too expensive and too dangerous to decontaminate, and the government quarantined indefinitely. It wasn't until 1981 that the idea of decontamination of Grunard Island came up again. Newspapers began receiving messages from Operation Dark Harvest. The messages demanded the immediate decontamination of the island. Operation Dark Harvest claimed they had a team of microbiologists collect contaminated soil from the island. One message threatened to leave the soil at appropriate points that will ensure the rapid loss of indifference of the government and the equally rapid education of the general public. Two boxes of samples were distributed. One was left at the military facility in Porton Down, another was left outside a government office where the Conservative Party was holding a conference. Although the Porton Down sample contained anthrax bacilli, the other sample did not. Finally, in 1986, decontamination began. Over 300 tons of formaldehyde, diluted with seaweed, was sprayed over every inch of the island. The topsoil with the highest contamination was also removed. Then, to test the safety of the island, a flock of sheep was placed there. Those sheep remained healthy. In 1990, four years after decontamination attempts, the island was deemed safe. And as promised, the family of the original owner was allowed to purchase the island back. For 48 years, the island sat in a state of ruin, ruin that could only be caused at the hands of humans. The London Monster Jack the Ripper has always gone down in legend as the infamous predator who stalked London's streets, preying upon the vulnerable and feasting on the panic and terror left in his wake. Jack the Ripper was not the first of his kind, however. A hundred years before Jack came the London Monster. The London Monster was the name given to a serial psychopath who similarly terrorised London in the late 18th century. The occurrences were many and widely reported, leading to a city and its inhabitants gripped by fear, outrage and dread. For two years, the purported maniac terrorised the city, slicing and dicing his way through the streets and into London's collective psyche. The attacks themselves followed a pattern. The monster stalked his victims from afar, following them at a distance through the dark, damp city alleyways. When he got close, he would verbally harass and curse his would-be victims before striking them a dozen ways with knives and blades hidden about his person. They were homemade, shrewdly crafted for his methods of attack. Sometimes the victim would be stabbed in the hips or in their buttocks, or kicked with a blade attached to his boot, and even struck with knives fastened to his knee. On other occasions, a shrouded figure would offer a bouquet of flowers to a lady, inviting her to enjoy the scent of them first. 
Unfortunately, the only thing she would receive would be a stab to the face from a sharp spike hidden in what turned out to be fake flowers. The screams of his victims would sound out through the streets, but the monster would not run off immediately, coldly observing the results of yet another successful attack. Frenzy filled the streets and vigilante mobs gathered, attacking anyone they thought who looked to be a suspect. Women dared not walk the streets, and those who had to slipped copper pans under their petticoats to order a semblance of protection from this public menace. Finally, in the summer of 1790, the public caught their man. A gangly youth by the name of Rinwick Williams was recognized and identified by a previous victim of the monster. He happened to work in an artificial flower factory nearby and was also identified by a second witness despite her previous description not bearing any resemblance to him. A third witness stated he was definitely not the man who had attacked her, but the newspapers had spoken and the mob was out for blood. Two trials took place, both extraordinarily long, taking up a lot of time and a lot of inches in the press. A clear alibi provided by workmates and questions over his likeness to the London monster himself was not enough to get him off, and Williams was found guilty and locked up. Whether the monster himself was found remains unsolved, but it's clear the London monster roamed the streets, a demon of the alleyways. Encounters with the Aswang Definitely seen as the strangest creature encountered, the Aswangs are an almost impossible to categorize and understand mysterious creature that has left many locals across the Philippines terrified for their lives. Given the fact that the country is often torn in tribal warfare and other terrorizing incidents surrounding actions of the Filipino government and revolutions involving the people, this has led to a number of stories surrounding the areas of the Philippines housing people that are not quite human. According to families at the center of revolutions, they have reported that on the outskirts of forests located away from larger population centers, there appears to be a grouping of inhuman creatures that are impossible to explain and are a great threat to the Filipino people. These creatures are known as the Aswangs and have been described as appearing human and establishing small human towns away from society. Although they might appear completely normal at first, the creature is described as being completely mute in human form and will run to hide when seen. If they get away, they will begin to transform and grow large wings similar to that of a bat and can separate from their lower halves as they fly through the air. Interestingly enough, Urban legends surrounding the creature have spread all across the Philippines, including stories of people having children with the creatures that are born with special powers or being able to encounter these creatures in hidden alleys in the city to be worked with as they promise to fight you for their own personal treasures. This has led many revolutionists across the country claiming to be descending from that of the Aswangs or using the tactic to inspire fear by claiming many of their freedom fighters are Aswangs. The Forbidden Prince John People with royal blood are perceived to be exempt from suffering. This is not the case for Prince John. After being diagnosed with epilepsy at age four, his body continued to deteriorate until he was sent to live separately from his family and was hidden from the public eye until he died at the age of 13. The poor boy suffered not only from his horrible disease, but also from the isolation and agony of being alone. He is known to the world as the Forgotten Prince. Prince John of the United Kingdom was born on July 12, 1905. He was the youngest of six children of King George V and his wife, Queen Mary. In 1910, his father started to reign as king and Prince John became fifth in line of succession. Before being diagnosed with epilepsy, Prince John experienced a happy childhood with the rest of his siblings. Though his father, who was known to be a disciplinarian, he openly expressed his affection to his children. Queen Mary was also described as a good mother who wanted her kids to confide in her. According to maidens who served the royal family during Prince John's early life, he was an eccentric and quirky kid. Although this behavior is commonly observed in ordinary children, it is not to be tolerated among royals. He would often show insubordination and hard-headedness. He simply did not understand that he needed to behave. This is one of the effects of epilepsy. 
During his seizures, his brothers and sisters would get so upset to the point that it would scare them. In 1916, his seizures got so severe that he was sent to live in Wood Farm, an outlying site on the family's Sandringham estate. He lived with his nanny named Lala Bill. His tutors were dismissed and his education was discontinued. It was not long before his physicians concluded that he would likely not reach adulthood. Queen Mary, in her efforts to help her son feel a sense of normalcy despite the situation, gathered a bunch of kids to be his playmates. Contrary to rumours, the young prince did not feel abandoned or neglected. He was in fact a cheerful and sweet kid. His playmates were later interviewed as adults and recounted their fond memories with him. Very little was known about the life of Prince John. The royal family kept his condition very private and almost a secret as they feared negative implications to their image as reigning monarchs. The forgotten prince passed away peacefully in his sleep on January 18, 1919. In one of her letters to a friend, Queen Mary expressed her thankfulness that her son's suffering is finally over and that he died very peacefully. His life story has been immortalised by a novel and TV drama called The Lost Prince. As epilepsy consumed his short life, Prince John was lonely and was frightened, but one thing he will never be is forgotten. Thank you.